Hi, welcome to another Retronaut video. So, in the late spring of 1994, I was working in Reading uh, for a company called ICL. And I'd been producing 3D animations to help sell their range of IBM PC compatibles. And these were then used in trade shows and in shops. In my spare time, I noodled around on 3D Studio, trying to improve my skills for the job and also uh, for fun. I'd been producing my own animations, and these were usually pretty short, as rendering them took time and obviously resources away from the company. And I had to make sure that obviously those resources were available for ICL's work uh, before mine. They tended to have a, a technological theme, uh, these animations, obviously because I was producing you know, demos for technology. But another reason was that 3D Studio wasn't really that good at producing organic shapes. Um, yeah, this was definitely still something which was quite difficult to do. This wasn't really a fault with 3D Studio itself. It was more to do with the maturity of 3D software at that point of time, you know, in the uh, relatively early 90s. I mean, sure, there was software out there that was better at 3D. And these were applications which were available on Silicon Graphics workstations. But even on that platform, on, with that software, um, most of that uh, modeling uh, Toolkit actually came from a CAD background, so it was generally aimed at producing sort of hard surfaces. So, to give you an idea, um, modeling a bicycle uh, wasn't really that difficult, um, as it had shapes in it like a torus and um, what you call uh, lofted and lathed shapes. And at the same time, modeling something organic, like say a dog or a bird or, or a person, for instance, was was really very difficult to do and ne nearly impossible, really. And it's actually for this reason why Pixar uh, chose Toy Story as the subject for their first motion picture. The reason why is because if you actually go back and watch Toy Story, most of the characters in it are actually articulated, uh, segmented objects, if I can put it that way. Uh, if you think of a puppet, um, then uh, you can imagine it hanging on strings and it's all articulated. Um, and that's basically what most of the characters are in Toy Story. And that meant that it was much easier for them to create the technology to model those and then animate them. You've got to bear in mind, you know, Pixar had massive resources compared to most companies. They had their own team of, uh, you know, sort of genius level 3D guys that developed a lot of the technology that we use today. But uh, even with those resources, it was pretty difficult for them to produce humans and uh, animals. Overall, these personal projects, they were just sort of, you know, 3D doodles, really. Um, and that was so I could kind of try out my ideas in 3D and you know, practice different techniques. And as I produced these, my modeling, my texturing, my lighting, and my animation skills, they all gradually improved. I would say probably out of those, animation lagged behind the most. And that was because I just didn't need to do complex animation for my uh, work. Um, most of the stuff that I was doing there was you know, animating cameras, which is, to be fair, very difficult, actually. And that was about it, really. Um, animated cameras was the, the, the sort of um, stalwart of what we were doing. I was there for about eight months. I was at home on the weekend and I was reading a, a video games magazine. And I can remember looking through the adverts on a classified page. I don't really know why I was doing that. I suppose, you know, you would find interesting things there, you know, pieces of equipment and things like that. And uh, I saw an advert from one of my video game uh, developer heroes. Um, they were advertising for a job to uh, produce animations for their new video game. And they specifically said that they wanted 3D skills in uh, 3D Studio. I, I really couldn't believe my eyes. So I hurriedly put together a video, uh, a videotape of everything that I'd done up until that point. And I also put some of my um, degree work on there as well to show a bit of variety. And um, I think that took like a week to put that together. And just as soon as I had got that all, all together, I got a v VHS videotape sent off to them. And I crossed my fingers and waited. Maybe a week later, I received a letter and uh, it was asking me to go for an interview in their London office. So this was looking really cool. Um, I couldn't believe that I was actually going to go and visit their office. I headed into London by train, and then I headed um, over London on the tube line. And I can remember that it was a really hot summer's day. It was pretty hot. I was a bit sweaty. I don't know if that was the anxiety of the interview or I think the weather. And I think it was a bit of both, really. I was nervous in the interview, of course. But I kind of knew in the back of my mind that I had some kind of chance because I knew that 
uh, there can't have really been that many people in the UK who were skilled with uh, 3D Studio in, in any way whatsoever, especially in terms of animation. And I did have some rudimentary animation skills. I can rem remember uh, climbing up the stairs. It was in a, a warehouse, uh, converted warehouse, and going in through the large metal door painted red. And uh, inside it had quite a low ceiling. I could see all these PCs everywhere and people uh, working away on uh, different video games. So that was pretty cool. You know, don't forget this was one of my favorite developers from the 80s, you know, basically heroes of mine. So it was quite surreal to find myself in their office. During the interview, they seemed genuinely interested in what I, you know, the work that I'd done. They were friendly and um, by the end of the interview, you know, it, it felt like it had gone pretty well. There were no really awkward questions. There were no sort of cliffhangers or anything like that. So I felt I had, you know, a pretty decent chance. It was just a case of luck, really, whether there was somebody out there who was just a little bit better than me. So I went back home and I waited on tenterhooks, obviously working during that week. By about Wednesday, I think I got a letter through the post and it said that they were going to offer me the job. You can imagine how happy I was at this point, you know. This was just amazing that this is a turned up in a magazine. I, I just happened to have the skills at exactly the right time. You know, I was going to work at this uh, hero company of mine. It was going to be working purely in 3D on 3D Studio. And I was going to start off by producing the intro to their new video game. And once that was done, I would then work on various cutscenes to show different aspects of the game. And that was very typical at the time. This was the CD-ROM era and uh, everybody basically had to do these animations um, to start off their games. So pretty soon I uh, moved to London. Uh, a couple of the guys at uh, ICL were really uh, kind. One of them, uh, Steve, I think his name was, um, had a car. So he offered to uh, help me take all my stuff to uh, London. And I remember one of the other guys went with me as well. He must have been excited about what was happening because he knew of this company as well. So I moved into a studio flat in Surrey Keys, which is sort of central southeast London. And uh, I got ready to work. So the next week came around, I started working, uh, I got set up in my desk and I started uh, beavering away. Uh, so this job was, you know, pretty intense, but I, I really loved it. And um, something uh, which had happened in Reading was that uh, my landlord had actually showed me uh, a new game that he had called Doom. Uh, this was, you know, uh, became pretty famous at this point because um, it had this new technology on the PC that allowed you to uh, play a first-person uh, shoot-em-up kind of game, uh, which up until then hadn't really been done that much, apart from by, obviously, ID. That was their, their previous game, was uh, Wolfenstein. Uh, but M Wolfenstein was a lot more pedestrian and uh, had a Nazi theme, whereas no, this was all demons, and um, it was much more fluid. Um, they fired back at you, and um, yeah, you know, Doom is Doom. <laughs> I don't really need to explain what Doom is. So... The only thing is I never actually got to play it at that time. Uh, my landlord showed it to me, but it was in his bedroom, so I couldn't really use the computer. So never actually got to play the game. But now in this new uh, job, I was actually, um, after work, we were having uh, death matches on Doom because all the machines there were networked together and all of uh, the developers and the 3D guys, we all had um, really high-end PCs. I think the developers may be a little bit, a bit, a little bit less high-end, but they were pretty good. Um, our PCs basically had the same graphics cards, but we had more RAM in them. So yeah, we would have, you know, a massively intense but fun death matches um, on the local network. And that was really amazing. Work was intense. Um, it was normally, uh, we were working until about 6.30 every day. Um, that was mainly because we just had so much to do and we were enjoying it. But, you know, there was, there was some uh, pressure, obviously, from the employers. Soon that had become weekends. Uh, and this was mainly so that we could check the renders that we kicked off on Friday evening. And then we would make uh, tweaks to those scenes, uh, you know, to fix little problems that we found in the renders. And then uh, we would kick them off again on Saturday. After a while, we also um, tended to come in on Sunday to do the same thing because there was just so much pressure to get this stuff rendered. Of course, you know, these visits on the weekend, um, the bosses weren't there generally. So quite often if they weren't there, uh, we'd have the odd uh, Doom session as well. So that was pretty cool. And uh, yeah, in the evenings, then we would sometimes on a Saturday go into central London to the nightclub. So, you know, it wasn't all work. Irrespective of the fun, I did tend to live in that office quite a lot. And I can remember realizing at one point that I was maybe getting a little bit burnt out. 
Sometimes people think that you know burning out is, is, is a situation where you're not actually enjoying the work. And that's not true. I was really enjoying it, but it was just too much. I was just working and working and working. And um, I just needed some more time to sort of relax and you know um, not think about 3D all the time. You know, I was on the borders of burning out, but it was definitely having um, an effect on my mental health. But I'm glad to say that I was actually mature enough to realize this. You know, I kind of realized, well, you know, this isn't good. I'm not feeling too good. And I, I realized I need to sort of step back a bit and uh, stop doing so much 3D. So yeah, that's what I did. I, I basically reduced my hours in work a little bit. Um, I wouldn't stay late. I wouldn't stay after 6.30 if I could. And on the weekends, I would try and um, keep coming in uh, on the weekends to one day if I could, if I could do that. So another aspect of this job was I was playing catch up to my 3D teammate. There were only actually two of us in the 3D team. And the other guy, Terry, he'd been working professionally using 3D Studio for a few years before I joined this company. As a result, he knew quite a lot more about animation specifically than I did. Uh, but he was kind enough to actually teach me what he knew. You know, I kind of started to catch up with him in terms of animation skills. I would say that in our team, I was the more talented modeler. That was mainly what I'd done um, at ICL. And I also, you know, I'd const when you model things, you tend to texture them. And uh, then I used to light them and then animate cameras. So really, most of the effort that I put into the scenes at ICL were in modeling, texturing, and lighting. So I did tend to have the edge on Terry in that respect, I think. And because of this, I tended to focus on doing environments. And um, I then branched out into doing creatures, which was, like I said, it was incredibly difficult to model these using 3D Studio. Um, you didn't really have the, the tools that you have today. And I'm not talking about packages like ZBrush. I'm just talking about um, poly modeling, where you can pull uh, polygons around like it's sort of like clay. You had to do things like you would loft a shape, which would make um, a shape like a cucumber. <laughs> Um, and you might be able to put like a bulbous end on to the end of it. And uh, that might be, for instance, the body of a penguin. Um, and then you do another loft, which was easier to do maybe the shape of the beak. And then you would put those together and that was your penguin. Um, that's about as sophisticated as you, you could do it with the tools that were in 3D Studio. And to be fair, most other 3D software at the time. Although Silicon Graphics um, modeling uh, did have NURBS, which is a, a slightly more complicated and uh, uh, capable modeling uh, system for doing organic shapes, but they're not used anymore. They weren't that great either, to be honest. One of the other problems I had there was that there was no time for training. Um, I was really in competition with my coworker, you know, he'd literally got a few years of experience on me and uh, I wanted to progress in the industry and I wanted to get up to his level. So I really needed to practice what I was learning, but we just didn't have any time to actually do any practice. We just had to constantly, you know, concentrate on producing assets, 3D assets, and then and then lighting them and animating them. So, you know, I was playing catch up and I'm not sure if the pressure was from myself or my work environment. Um, it was probably, to be honest, a little bit of both. But back at home in my small flat, I still had my, you know, basically my shiny new Amiga 4000, which was my pride and joy at that point. I was still playing games on it. You know, there were some really cool AGA games coming out. But in work, I was getting exposed to, you know, the IBM PC. I was lucky to use a very high-end IBM PC. And we were playing, you know, games like Doom on it and uh, other high-end games on the PC. So it started to sort of shine a slightly unfavorable light on the Amiga 4000. And uh, during this time, I started to come to a pretty harsh realization. I really, really needed to practice 3D Studio. Um, so really, I needed to try out this stuff at home before I actually used it in work. I, I came to the decision that I knew, you know, I had to sell my A4000 to buy an IBM PC because you couldn't run 3D Studio on anything else. And I didn't have the room in my uh, apartment for anything other than just one computer, really. I used to actually use my Amiga 4000 on the floor in the living room. Um, there was a sofa here, there was a TV there, and I used to put the Amiga 4000 there, keyboard on my lap here with a mouse pad, and uh, that's how I used to play games. I definitely didn't have enough room for two computers with that kind of setup. It was bad enough having that with just one. So the other problem was the spec that I would have to get for a machine to run 3D Studio would have to be pretty high. You know, it would have the, the side effect of being a really good gaming machine as well. But the main reason I was getting this PC was actually um, to get a kind of 3D workstation. So 
I also had to sell the Omega 4000 because I just needed the money to be able to afford that. So this was kind of a repeat of what happened with my Dragon 32, if you, um, if you watch that video. In that video, you might remember that uh, Dragon Data went bankrupt. And because of that situation to get my money back, I, I really had to sell my Dragon 32. I didn't have the luxury of just getting more money and, and buying another computer. I had to sell it and then basically upgrade to a new machine. So that was exactly the situation again here. And it's funny because again, the money all the way going back to my Atari 2600 had been uh, recycled for each generation. I had to sell that machine and then upgrade to a new machine. So um, this PC would be the next uh, computer in that uh, long lineage. I had to let my Amiga go, even though it was the last thing I really wanted. You know, I, I, I'd had it for about eight, eight or nine months at that time. So from what I remember, I think I got back most of the value. So that was good. But I also had some savings at that point. I wasn't really going out that much. Uh, my rent was a lot more than when I lived in Reading because now I had a studio flat all of my own. So I was living on my own for the first time. So that was quite a luxury, I suppose. And yeah, I'd learned to build PCs when I was at ICL. That was actually part of the job. So I decided that I was going to actually use those skills to build my own PC, which would save me quite a bit of money actually over buying a computer off one of the manufacturers that was around at the time. So I headed into Tottenham Court Road in the centre of London. Tottenham Court Road, if you've never heard of it back then, it was a, a sort of mecca for PCs and uh, Apple Macintoshes. There, there were a lot of uh, distributors there and it was where you went if you wanted to buy some parts. Don't forget in those days, you didn't really buy stuff off the internet. You bought things from magazines um, and obviously there would be postage for that. So it was actually better for me to go with a large bag to Tottenham Court Road and go around and um, shop all the parts, buy the motherboard, buy the memory, buy the graphics card. Soon I was back home on that Saturday, I think it was. And uh, by the following day, I'd put that PC together and it was ready to go apart from a few bugs and you know issues with drivers and things like that. From what I remember, I was actually downloading the drivers in work because I didn't have an internet connection in my uh, apartment. So in work, I think we were using PCs that probably would have cost uh, more than 8,000 pounds. And in today's money, that's more like 16,000 um, pounds. And the main cost in that was um, obviously the processor, but memory was very, very expensive in those days. And I, I couldn't afford quite that much memory, but don't forget at home, I wouldn't be doing the sort of super complex scenes that I would be required for that video game. I'd be doing uh, simpler tests. So I didn't need as much memory, I knew that. I knew that I would need a pretty decent uh, CPU and, and the rest of it was really optional. Um, the hard disk obviously would be something like an IDE that was kind of normal on a PC. But by putting all of this stuff together myself, I could probably get a PC which was viable for what I wanted to do for about 2,000 pounds, 4,000 pounds today. I probably went for something that was more like two and a half uh, because I'd probably put more memory in than you would have in a bog standard machine. So in today's money, you're talking about a machine which cost about 5,000 pounds. So definitely not cheap. Now, normally in these videos, at this point, I would probably turn to the uh, machine here and give you a demo of, um, in this case, an IBM PC, the IBM PC that I had back then. But the problem is I don't have that machine. And I can't reproduce that machine because it was a custom built IBM PC. Uh, that machine was uh, sold or recycled many years ago. So I don't really have that to show you. So what I'd like to do in this video is a, a bit of a cool uh, departure where I'll give you a little bit more information about my job and then we'll have a look at this machine in a bit. So don't skip ahead if you can, uh, wait until the end. Well, wait for a little bit longer and we'll see what we have here. After about a year, I think my employers had uh, an idea brewing. What they wanted to do was to see if we could make producing 3D uh, a little bit easier for us. Obviously modeling was a big issue and the uh, display on our IBM PCs wasn't so good for doing animation because basically the display would actually make objects appear as cubes and then they would, it would fully render those uh, when you left go. So, they had this idea that maybe we could evaluate some high-end hardware and software and see if maybe we could afford it. In this era, in uh, early to mid uh, 1990s, the leader of, the, of this field was Silicon Graphics. Um, and they were also known as SGI. Um, they rebranded as SGI later. So we'll call them SGI in this video because Silicon Graphics is a bit long-winded. 
SGI, they'd started in 1981 uh, in California, like so many other tech companies like uh, Sun and NVIDIA and so on. And they specialized in high-end proprietary 3D workstations. And during the 1980s, they'd gone from strength to strength producing these. They, uh, their machines got more and more powerful. And apart from these workstations, they also produced these refrigerator-sized uh, servers called reality engines. And the reality engines were like the top of their range. And these would have been used to produce the um, airline and military uh, flight simulators of the day, which were basically things that were completely out of the price range of anybody else. You know, you had Microsoft Flight Simulator, but that was um, very, very basic compared to the kind of um, flight simulators that you needed to train actual pilots on. So yeah, SGI actually produced those. They also produce an API for these uh, 3D applications that run on their hardware. And the API allowed you to get access to its 3D hardware. Um, and you would write the software using the API. And that would then guarantee that whatever SGI workstation that you used it on, the API would then allow that software to work fully using the hardware. That would you know, vary from one uh, workstation and uh, server to another. And uh, this API was called uh, OpenGL which is pretty famous really. Now in time, OpenGL would be the inspiration for pretty much all of today's 3D APIs, things like uh, Direct3D, Vulkan, uh, Metal, and so on. So yeah, a very, very important development uh, from SGI. And with this powerful hardware, they also, uh, they're also developed a small stable of power 3D apps, which found use in movies, TV graphics, and also in advertising. By the early 90s, these applications were well established and they all competed with each other, which really, really drove up the standards on the SGI platform. So out of these apps, notable ones were Softimage, which uh, featured a powerful ray trace capable renderer called Mental Ray. And it was also a really good animation package. So it was used for a lot of uh, character animation back in the day. You also had Power Animator from Alias, which uh, actually used a scanline renderer, so it couldn't really do that much ray tracing. Um, but it did have really cool atmospheric effects, you know, fog and uh, beams of light coming from lights. And it also had a very uh, well-developed animation system as well. And you also had Wavefront. And this focused on, uh, from what I remember, simulating things. So, it would do rigid body dynamics, um, which is basically things like cubes falling onto the floor and rolling around, and soft body dynamics. Um, what would be a good example of that? Let's say a, a soft, squishy ball um, bouncing and wobbling. Um, that's an example of that. And they also did cloth dynamics as well. So this was all really cool, esoteric stuff at the time. So our boss, he arranged for us to visit these companies uh, to see what these apps had to offer. And then for us to have the loan of an actual Silicon Graphics workstation. I remember it was an Indigo workstation, a pizza box um, shaped machine, as I remembered. And we could then try out these apps for a couple of weeks. So yeah, I mean, these machines, they were, you know, they were like alien technology back in the late 1980s and in the early 90s. And, uh, there just wasn't anything available for the IBM PC, Macs, or Amigas to compare with them, you know, in terms of real-time 3D rendering power. On 3D Studio, we had to make do with our characters uh, appearing, as I said earlier, as boxes or groups of boxes, if it was an articulated um, group of animatable objects. <laughs> Very long-winded way of saying, say, a character, you know, like a robot or something like that. So whenever you moved the camera or whenever you moved any part of that uh, robot, it would render it only as boxes. And why this was a problem was if you were trying to position, uh, let's say, the fingers of the robot on a can uh, or like a cylinder or something like that, it was a nightmare. I, I can remember trying to uh, get a character to grab a cylinder. I think it was a can of beer or something like that. What that meant was I literally had to um, pose each segment of each finger one by one so that they appeared to touch lightly on the surface and not just actually intersect with the, the uh, cylinder. And you could only really see the intersection when you uh, stopped moving the finger segment. Then if you rotated the camera, everything rendered as a box. And then when you left go, it did the full render again, which to be honest, wasn't real time. It took about one and a half seconds to draw the entire screen. So yeah, it was pretty janky, but you know, that was PC technology at that time. 
at the same time, you know, we were seeing demos of an SGI workstation where that movement was wireframe fully rendered all the time at a really good frame rate. So that made life a lot easier. And it could even actually um, show those objects in shaded 3D, which obviously if you're trying to work out, you know, when one object is uh, going through another, um, that's gold. You know, it just makes your life so much easier. I'll give you an, an example. Getting that robot to grab that uh, cylinder probably took the best part of a couple of hours. Whereas on an SGI, we could probably do the same kind of work in about uh, five minutes. So yeah, you know, you, you paid a great deal for this power though. You know, um, these workstations, they started out at about 18,000 um, pounds and that was for an Indigo. And then they went all the way up to about 200,000 uh, pounds for something like a reality engine. In today's money, you're talking about double that. So yeah, 36,000 pounds for a, an entry workstation. And then you're talking about um, 400,000 to half a million for one of these reality engines. You know, this was big, big budget stuff. And if that wasn't eye-watering enough, the software also cost a fortune as well. I think Soft Image cost about, I think it was 15,000 pounds per license. And again, in today's money, that's about 30,000 pounds. So basically for each person in our team, that luckily there were only two of us, they would need to spend about 66,000 pounds just to get the workstations and the software for each one of us. We made visits to the Soft Image Power Animator and Wavefront offices for a demo of each app. And once that was all over, SGI actually loaned us an Indigo workstation, which has, I think it has Soft Image on it, and I think Power Animator as well. So we only really had that machine for about two weeks, and I think we could only really use it in the evening. Like I said, there was no time for training, so it was our time when we did any kind of training. Obviously, I had to take turns with my coworker to get some time on that machine. I did manage to get a little project done though. I was actually tasked with updating the company's website because I had a graphic design degree at that point. The web was completely new, so I was learning HTML and I was hand coding it in just a simple text editor. There was no such thing as a web ID in those days. You just wrote things in text and off you went. So I redesigned the company's uh, banner, um, which was um, had little buttons to allow you to go to different parts of the website uh, for different games. and I. I did a kind of metal uh, effect, like a framework. And in that framework there, there were sort of glass lenses, which you then saw the logo through using refraction. Uh, it looked really cool. It looked like a kind of Nixie. Um, I don't know if you've seen those. They're like um, 1970s era's uh, LCD display. Um, and the shining it through glass made it look really cool. Uh, it took a long time to render, it took a few days to render, but then uh, obviously, I had to then get that into the website and uh, get that to all work. I remember it was dead slow. Uh, it looked really cool, but it took about two minutes, I think, for that uh, UI to download. But in those days, you know, the the data speeds were pretty slow by compared to today. We're talking about uh, kilobits per second in those days, um, whereas today we're talking about megabits or even gigabits per second. So yeah. You know, it's not surprising that um, just a single bitmap used to take minutes to download rather than, what, seconds today or even fractions of a second. So in the end, after all this evaluation and getting excited and using this really cool software and so on and so forth, we never actually got these SGI workstations. And it was a difficult decision, I understand, for my employer. And the main criteria that they used to say that it wasn't justified was that rendering would have been a real problem. And I can see what they're, they're talking about because basically, although the CPUs in Silicon Graphics workstations were better than I think 486s, the 486s were so much cheaper and we already had several of them. I think it was like 10, we had 10 machines in the office and about half of those were pretty high-end machines. So we could actually use those as a render farm. So we could set off a render and distribute them on those machines in the office, which made a big difference to our render times. So although it was more difficult for us to do work and the software was less capable, we did have the, the benefit of those PCs to render on. And that, as it turns out, was a major economic bar to us getting those workstations. So yeah, um, unfortunately, we never actually got them. I never actually personally um, owned any of these machines. Just like the Quadra in a previous video, these were very, very expensive machines, you know, over twice the price of the Quadra actually. You know, there was just no way in those days I was ever gonna afford um, an SGI workstation. But 
you know, using these machines, it was like using the future. It was literally like using a machine from the middle of the 2000s in the early 90s. It ran its own operating system called IRIX, which was a really cool version of Linux. Uh, sorry, Unix, I should say. Linux didn't actually exist at this point. I think it had just been um, thought of. It had a really cool windowing operating system. You know, back then we were using uh, Windows 3. Point whatever it was, it wasn't very good. So yeah, we were just using DOS and we were using Windows, so I think to run Photoshop on to do uh, texturing work. So you couldn't actually texture at the same time that you were doing 3D. You had to go back and forth between them and boot into Windows, do some Photoshop work, boot out of Windows, uh, restart the machine, start up 3D Studio. You know, it was, it was pretty rudimentary compared to the SGI. So yeah, never actually owned one of these machines, but now I do. And that's what we have here. So this is a Silicon Graphics Octane. Take this cloth off you. It's not actually from exactly the same era as um, the uh, machine I, we were going to use. That was um, an Indigo. Uh, this comes from a few years later. Uh, let me just show you the front of the machine first, and then um, I'll explain a little bit more about it. So this is the Octane. Um, it's an absolute beast of a machine. It weighs about 25 kilos. It's physically a difficult machine to move. I actually store this in a mezzanine in my office, um, which is about uh, 10 foot up, uh, and you have to get to it via a stepladder. And believe me, it's a, it's a very precarious thing to get this down. I do actually have the keyboard for it. It does actually work. We're only going to do a very quick overview of the machine here, so I'm not going to demonstrate it running. But one of the first things I did when I got the machine was, number one, I ordered the keyboard because I didn't have that, and I got the mouse as well. And then I basically tested it. Um, it requires, I think it's, um, it syncs on green. That's the, uh, the type of video that it has. And luckily I have an old um, HP uh, monitor that's uh, VGA, and it does actually work, so. The SGI machines, they, um, they had a very strong sort of um, branding and uh, appearance. Very often you had these very strong primary colors. Earlier machines in the series were, for instance, you had the, uh, the Crimson, and that was you know, a Crimson machine. Um, then you had the Indigo, and that was a kind of blue, bluey purple. Um, so there we are. Um, and you also had the Peach as well. Um, no, actually you didn't have the Peach, that's a joke. But yeah, most of the other machines, they had this sort of strong color branding. By this point in its life, um, there was another company called uh, Discrete Logic. And they had a range of video editing products, um, real-time, high-end, very expensive um, systems. And um, they all had names like Flint and Flame and Inferno. So you can, you can see there's a bit of a fire theme going on. And this machine was very often used to deliver the computing for those systems. Um, so you can see that what um, SGI has actually done here is they've gone for the sort of fire-end, fuel-heat type thing going on here to, to kind of fit in with the discrete logic. Bit of kind of cross-branding going on there, I think. This um, originally would have had the, uh, the Cube um, SGI logo here, which is a really nice design. I always like that design. But by this point, they changed to um, a logo type. And that shows that this must be a slightly later um, Octane, because as I said, the original Octanes had that square badge there. I'll show that to you. This was uh, eventually superseded by the Octane 2, which is, I believe, a blue color. And that has, uh, you know, a few evolutionary upgrades to it, I would say. I'm not sure if it was that much of a difference in, in terms of um, capability. They had a very curvilinear design by this point. Earlier on, they had a slightly more boxy uh, appearance, um, but actually, you know, nice industrial lang language all the way along that reflected the kind of money that you were paying for these things. Um, let's turn it to camera a little bit and um, let's have a look inside the door. Um, so this is where the drive bays are. There are two uh, three and a half inch um, bays here for external media. You know, you could have a floppy disk here, which obviously wouldn't have really been a thing to be honest on SGI. But in this case, it's got a tape drive. So obviously if you needed two tape drives for whatever reason, um, you could pop, pop them in these bays. It does actually have um, other drive bays, and I'll show you that in a second. There's the power button. There's the reset button, which is recess to stop you making a mistake. And then this clear plastic uh, accent here is actually the um, uh, status indicator. So I think it's probably power. I'm not sure if it does hard drive as well. Um, don't forget, a lot of the time, your data would have been coming across the network. So yeah, the, um, the hard drive indicator wasn't so uh, critical on this particular machine. Um, it's very nicely designed, this case. Um, I think you'll agree it's a very attractive machine. 
Um, and we can get access to the drive bays very easily because we can just push two tabs here at the top and literally that's all it takes to get inside um, to the drive bays. Um, this is one of those uh, caddies that you can pull out. It has a uh, SCSI drive in it, SCSI 2 drive, which was kind of like, um, I think that was the ultimate expression of SCSI really. Um, I think it's got like something like 40 uh, megabytes a second bandwidth on it. Obviously you've got enough room there for two. I think you could have a RAID drive as well, uh, a controller as well, and then you could have two drives. Um, so yeah, that's pretty cool, isn't it? Um, very solid in terms of build. This is all uh, pretty thick steel. There's a honeycomb here, um, and there are vents at the top here, and there are vents at the top here as well to suck air in. It looks like there's also a vent there, um, and you've got a vent on the front of the machine here, but I'm not really sure how functional that is and how much you, you need it, to be honest, because you've got these vents at the top to suck air in downwards. So uh, let me put this back on, and we'll uh, rotate it around and we'll have a look at the back. Okay, we're around the back. Uh, let me give you a bit of a whistle stop tour of it. Very quickly, uh, as an overview, you've got the power supply, uh, which is easily removed. You've got two thumb screws there. It can be pulled out. A new one can be popped in very quickly, just in case it failed and you had to happen one of these um, spare in work, which is really cool. It has a graphics card. Um, you can see that there are multiple slots here. And I think this graphics card, I've never actually pulled it out. And the reason for that is the, the bus connectors on these is notoriously very fragile. Um, this machine works and I'd like to keep it that way. Um, so for now, um, I'm not gonna try taking that off. Over here, you've got the system panel. Um, this is where the, most of the IO happens. You've got the uh, vent here for the heatsink for the CPU. CPU upgrade here. Um, I'm not quite sure what that indicates, to be honest. This, as far as I know, is where you can have a PCI expansion. That may sound a bit weird. Why would you need a PCI expansion? Well, because they were cheaper. And a lot of the um, equipment for the SGI was proprietary and sometimes was a little bit um, specialist. So, so by this point, they were embracing sort of like standard off-the-shelf PC parts as well to bring down the cost and increase the flexibility of the machine. So it's really cool that they sort of embraced that and allowed you to use um, PCI cards. So you might want to put like, you could put like an ethernet in there or something like that, a fiber channel or whatever it might be. Looking at the IO, um, you've got two um, serial ports here. I think one of these is a console port as well, which you can use to debug the machine if the uh, display isn't working. So if you haven't got the uh, graphics card plugged in, then you could still actually see some kind of output from the machine uh, via that. And obviously the most important thing about that serial port is that you can connect this up to your PDP-11 mini computer, which is very important, of course, in 1998. Um, then above the two serial ports, you've got a keyboard connector on the left and mouse on the right. I'm not sure if it, those are standard um, connections, but when I bought this machine, I really wanted it to have the, the complete look, which is why I actually got the SGI keyboard and the mouse. So we got the complete set. Um, we'll be looking at this in a lot more detail in a future video. And what I really want to do as well is look at the software on this because everybody kind of skips that, which is kind of sad because that's what made this machine alive. You know, if you think about us, we are but shells and it is our you know, brain and our character that actually makes us uh, you know, a living thing. And it's the same thing with this. You know, the software was a very important part of it and it's something that people do tend to sort of skip over. Parallel port there, two parallel lines, that's the parallel port. Then you've got uh, an ethernet port there. We've got some scribbled writing on this one, I don't know why. Um, obviously there was some kind of um, IT stuff going on in the office. Then you've got a SCSI connector here. Two optical sound in and out. Uh, well, one in, one out, um, which is very, very high end. If you think about how um, common optical uh, audio was back in the 90s, it wasn't really. So that's pretty amazing that you can get um, fully uh, digital audio in and out. Then you've got coaxial um, audio. Uh, it looks like this is um, out, left and right. Then you've got um, line here, uh, left and right channels as well, out and in. Uh, then you've got some kind of, um, what's this, 10 volts DC. I'm quite sure what that's for. It must be some kind of microphone maybe, because um, um, actually for headphones. And then up here, you've got a microphone input there. This has a very high-end uh, sound chip as well. I think it does something like 24-bit audio, multiple channel. It's pretty high-end stuff. So if you think about it, this was used for video editing. So you might have multiple sets of video with um, high-quality audio on each one. Well, this machine can support it. 
Let's just talk about this, uh, the Venture for the CPUs. The CPUs, this machine I think can have two CPUs and they get really hot, as you can imagine. Um, and this is actually solid steel, um, I think, or maybe aluminium. I honestly think that if you were in a gunfight and you got behind this and the bullet hit you, it would actually protect you, which is pretty amazing because I know from Mythbusters that if you go behind the, the um, door of a car, the bullet would actually pass through that and probably hit you. So yeah, if you're ever in a gunfight and you need to um, protect yourself, put one of these in front of you and you'll almost certainly be safe. Yeah, maybe not. The graphics card. This graphics card could do uh, shaded uh, 3D with texture mapping at a time when both of those were not that common. You were starting to see it on PCs with video games, obviously, in the 90s, but this had much higher uh, capabilities in that uh, area. It cost a fortune for these graphics cards. I think the most expensive one was about £18,000 or dollars. Um, what would that be? Something like £14,000, which would be these days, you're talking about £28,000 for a graphics card. That graphics card is about the size of this machine. It's absolutely enormous. So yeah, if you think the 4090s right now are impressive, imagine what it would have looked like uh, comparing your PCI graphics card back in the 90s to that, you know. The graphics card was basically the size of most PCs, motherboards. Everything on it was proprietary, had dedicated uh, texture RAM and processing. Um, very, very impressive. One of the best things about this machine as well was the bus, the system bus. So it used a system called XIO. And what it meant was that every part of this machine could talk to every other part without basically um, having any sort of bottlenecks. If you're going to edit video and you're using one of these flame systems, then you basically don't want it where it's glitching and slowing down and choking on, you know, ingesting the data. The XIO bus was way, way, way in advance than anything on the PC and um, it just made this machine absolutely fly. It's a little bit like, for instance, if you think about um, some American muscle cars, they have this incredible engine in them, and then they have these normal tires and they have a normal suspension. And, they, and because of that, you've basically got too powerful an engine and you don't have the rest of the car up to that spec, you know, and you can't really put the power down with those kind of wheels and without um, any sort of downforce. And if you think about some of the sort of super supercars that we have these days, you have the rest of the machine, you know, the disc brakes and all that kind of stuff, which allows you to handle the power of that engine. Well, that's basically what this machine is like. A PC back in the day, it had a really good engine in it compared to this. It wasn't as good, but you know, it was pretty decent and getting better all the time. But the problem is the rest of the PC really wasn't that great. And you know, the bus and so forth and all that. All of this sort of, um, the parts that go together to make the whole, they weren't so great. This machine had just amazing technology inside it. The only problem was, um, this would have probably cost you, I'm not quite sure, they, they, I think they ranged in price from about $20,000 to about $80,000, these particular machines. If you were going to have this machine, from what I understand, with a, a flame setup, you could be talking close to half a million. And this machine would obviously be relatively small part of that price. When you paid for a flame system, you had to have a big desk. People would actually come into your office and set the machine up for you. Um, they would install all the software, install the machine, get it all working, get it all calibrated. And if there was ever a problem with the machine, they would be straight round to your office and they would come and fix it for you. So you had that service agreement because it was like a piece of equipment that you used to make money. You know, you used it to edit films, you used it to edit adverts. And when an advertiser came in and they wanted you to edit something live in front of them, which was often the case, because advertising people have got an incredible, incredibly huge ego and lots of money. So they like to force you to sit there and um, you know, do things live in front of them. Um, it's, it's a bit um, creepy really. But these machines were used for that. And uh, what would happen is then they would be charged literally by the minute for their time in the flame suite. And I actually see, I've actually seen these in action. I mentioned it in this video. I worked on a documentary on uh, the, the pyramids of Giza and that was actually edited on a flame suite, quite probably on an octane, but I never actually got to see it because it was actually hidden inside the desk, which was quite funny. I guess it was the branding of discrete logic. They wanted to, you to see their, their branding more than anything and not to fixate too much on uh, the SGI that was inside it. This particular machine was used actually for developing or testing out uh, flight simulators, as far as I know. I spoke to the person I bought it from. They didn't mention which company they work for, but they did say that it was, was used back in the day for developing a flight simulator. 
And the company, uh, it turns out, is Boeing. Because when I got this machine back and I booted into it, it had uh, the Boeing name on it. Don't worry, Boeing, there's nothing on this machine. Your employee made a good point of blanking it. And so there's nothing um, which has been given away. Don't worry about it. So yeah, um, let me rotate it around. Oh, there we are. Yeah, the Octane. Uh, what an incredible machine. I wouldn't have used these back in uh, my uh, video game days. It was actually an Indigo that we were loaned, which is a cool machine as well. I'd like to get one of those maybe one day. But obviously that would have been quite a lot less powerful than this because this machine came out, I think, about three or four years later. You know, in those days, that was a long time in technology. So this was a much more powerful machine and a much more heavy machine as well, I've got to say. It is absolutely um, killer to carry. So yeah, the SGI Octane. What a fantastic machine, huh? Um, I'm looking forward to doing some really interesting videos on it in the future. And I hope, if I can, to show you the software. Very often when people talk about this machine, they never actually used one and they never actually, they don't really understand these days what it was really used for. Um, I actually used um, one of its compatriots from a couple of years earlier. I used it in anger with Soft Image, I think it was, and uh, you know, I noodled around a little bit in Power Animator. Uh, but yeah, in the future, we're definitely going to come back to this and uh, look at this wonderful machine and uh, get into it in a little bit more depth. Let's talk about what happened after the video game company. Eventually, the game was finished and I decided to leave. After a while, I kind of decided to get out of video games. And there were a few reasons for that. Uh, one of them was there was a massive downturn in the video game industry at that time. And um, I did actually work for one more company, but... Basically, that company that I work for um, and the second company I work for, after a couple of years, they were gone. And that was true of so many different companies in those days. So many different companies went bankrupt. And it was mainly because you had the introduction of the Sony PlayStation and CD-ROMs. And uh, the problem with CD-ROMs was it, it meant that you had to produce these very expensive assets. You know, the animation that I was working on meant that they had to hire me and my co-worker and they had to have these PCs. And all of that resource was going into stuff that wasn't really the video game. So it just meant that the, the amount of money that you had to um, get to, to, to produce a game and compete with other games out there just increased massively. It was just exponential. And some of these companies, they just couldn't afford to do that. And the, the publishers didn't really help them. You know, it wasn't their job necessarily to help these developers. And so many really cool companies they just went by the wayside and that was very, very sad. I can say that, you know, at that video game, I wasn't paid a lot of money. In today's money, it seems reasonable, actually, what I was paid. But at that time, you know, um, considering uh, the amount of training that I had and the work that I was producing, it was really uh, underpaid, I think. So, yeah, that was a bit of a problem. I started to look over the fence. You know, I'd done some web uh, work for that video game company and my flatmate, um, at the time, uh, suggested that I go and do some web work for um, a bank uh, that he was doing uh, development work for. I must admit, it was a bit boring, um, but they wanted some quite cool stuff. They wanted me to actually render the icons in 3D for their website. That's all I was asked to do. And, um, I was paid so much more money for doing that work. And it became clear to me that something like web was, you know, something somewhere where I could just get so much more money. It wasn't as much fun. But, you know, video games back then, they, the jobs were a little bit ephemeral. It was very, you know, unreliable. So, yeah, you know, I decided that I was going to move into other fields. So after doing a little bit of web, I did some uh, 3D visualization of a hotel in Cairo. That was using 3D Studio Max, which was the successor to 3D Studio. And it was a complete rewrite. They moved from DOS to using Windows NT, which made the entire oper operating system much more reliable. And it allowed you to use a lot more memory. And by this point, you're talking about sort of Pentium machines and Pentium 2s. So I managed to get a hold of 3D Studio Max and I trained myself up on it. So yeah, you know, I was working on this uh, visualization of this hotel in Cairo. It was quite a high-end project, actually. And what that involved was producing um, images of the exterior of the hotel and then uh, the interior spaces, you know, the pool area and the, uh, there was an interior shopping mall and a few other places like that. Yeah, so, you know, for what it was, I had a pretty big budget and it was a pretty steep learning curve, learning how to do ArchViz. So that was interesting. And then after, I think, about eight months there, a friend of mine, who's sadly not with us anymore, 
he said he was working in, um, I think he was working in Shepparton as an electrician. And he'd met um, the uh, 3D supervisor on a film, uh, Lost in Space. I don't know if you remember it, it had uh, Matt LeBlanc in it. That film had actually produced its VFX using 3D Studio Max. Anyway, that project had been a success for him and he'd moved on and uh, he was hired to actually work for a company doing the pilot for a TV series for a, a production company in America called Children's Television Workshop. So I don't know if you've heard of that company, you probably have. They're the, they're the company that actually produces Sesame Street. So, you know, they're a bit of a household name really. And we were working on a new kids TV series um, that was going to be produced by them, hopefully. I was hired to work on the pilot and my job involved making the environments, lighting them um, and doing animation. Yeah, just doing various bits and bobs. That took, I think, about three months and uh, the pilot went on to be successful and it led to an actual series that then I was um, held on to be the head of lighting. I actually wanted to be an animator on that TV series, but I was advised by the management that I would be paid half as much and I would be expected to produce about seven seconds of animation per day. Now, to put that into context, if you, if you worked on a Pixar movie back in those days, you were expected to produce about seven seconds of animation per week. <laughs> yeah, seven seconds of animation today is a lot of animation. And because of the budget, it was, you know, for, for a kids' TV series, they just didn't have the budget of Pixar. So you just have to produce everything much faster into a lower quality. And I just thought, you know, well, I'm not really going to enjoy being under that much pressure to produce that animation. So I may as well enjoy the position of being um, head of lighting. And the job was actually head of lighting and modeling. So that was pretty cool. The series was a success. I've actually got toys from it. And I actually remember it being in McDonald's and I've got some McDonald's toys as well uh, from the TV series. So yeah, it did pretty well. The production company that made it, they didn't really make that much profit. So they weren't very enthusiastic about doing an, um, another series of it. So unfortunately, that's where it ended. But it, uh, within its own little world, it was a really big success. And I think there must be a lot of kids out there today who are now in their 20s who um, have fond memories of that TV series. So from there, um, I didn't have any work for a little while. And uh, I did then manage to get a job working for uh, a TV series for the World Cup the FIFA World Cup. I'm talking about soccer, not American football. And that went on for a while. And then I managed to get a job working on a documentary for the BBC and Discovery. And that was a documentary about building of the, the Great Pyramid of Giza. Now, people used to make fun of me at the time saying, well, that can't have been very difficult. You just make a pyramid primitive in a 3D piece of software, uh, texture it white and the job's done. Okay, well, yeah, I mean, that would have been easy, but this was actually modeling the Great Pyramid of Giza when it was being built. So, you know, I was modeling all the different blocks, the ramp, which went up the outside of the uh, the pyramid, texturing the pathways, um, and then modeling these little, like little huts that were uh, dispersed across the top plateau of the, of the pyramid as it was being built. And that was for the builders to shelter in, you know, to get some water and to have some food. Um, because obviously in our imagination, it's Egypt and it's the middle of summer and they're on top of this white massive uh, stone uh, structure and they must have been absolutely boiling, so yeah. We had the, the sort of uh, some creature comforts for the, the people working on it. That was really successful, actually. And uh, we were nominated for an Emmy individually, but unfortunately we didn't win. But anyway, you know, being nominated is pretty cool. That particular series was produced on uh, Soft Image XSI. So that was a new package I had to learn. And um, I wasn't really hired for my lighting skills on it because the lighting was really simple. I was mainly hired on that particular project to do the modeling. So yeah, modeling the, the Great Pyramid of Giza. So that was pretty cool. After a few months, um, that ended. And at this point, you know, I was starting to get into a groove of doing some work and then it would end and then you would have a, a little bit of period when you were unemployed and you were looking so for some work. So I really wanted to get into something that was a little bit more stable. And uh, some friends of mine um, had managed to get jobs working in visual effects. So I decided to try and go in that direction. I ended up working in visual effects. I, would, I was what was called a generalist. What that meant was I could do everything. You know, I could do uh, modeling, lighting, animation, uh, particle effects, you name it, I could do it to a certain degree. I wasn't necessarily a master all, of all of those things, but I could do all of them, you know, to some degree. I was, I trained myself generally on everything, so I knew a little bit of everything. And I would probably say my strengths were in modeling and lighting. 
in visual effects, you don't generally do everything. So that was mainly my job. I would work on various movies being uh, a lighter. But there were a couple of movies where I actually worked as a generalist and I did everything. I mean, there was one project I can remember working on where I, I built Digger, you know, like a JCB um, or a cat in America. I actually, no, I didn't build it. I got the model off a CD that I bought, um, which had 3D models on it. But I did rig it, which means I basically put all the bits together to make it animatable. Then I animated it. And then I used that in a shot that I was actually working on. And I was given that shot and I had to do everything in that shot. I had to place all the objects, set, dress it, put objects, you know, put trees in different places, basically build the scene. And then I had a car park, the camera moved like this. And in the car park, I wanted some kind of motion because it didn't want the image to look too still. I think we moved the palm trees slightly. We got a little bit of sway in them. And then in the, in the car park, I actually animated the JCB driving around with some dirt. It was doing some building work there or something. So yeah, you know, that was pretty cool. The software we were using was Maya. And Maya was the, the sort of love child of uh, Power Animator and Wavefront. Alias had actually bought or merged with Wavefront. And they then got together and created a new piece of software, which kind of had the best parts of both apps. Um, and that was called Maya. It actually ran on Linux. And at that time, that was a bit of a revolution that was going on in visual effects because the Silicon Graphics software, you know, um, Soft Image, Power Animator, and so on, that had all been developed on the um, uh, Silicon, Silicon Graphics uh, version of Unix, which was called IREX. And for film, they didn't really want to necessarily pay for those machines. Um, there was a bit of a transition going on to using PCs. Um, so funnily enough, <laughs> I moved out of video games and I thought, now I'm going to get a Silicon Graphics workstation. And by this point in the early 2000s, they were kind of being stepped over for PCs because uh, PCs were so much cheaper. The same um, economies were going on with rendering. So yeah, unfortunately, I didn't get to use Silicon Graphics machines in the, in the VFX industry either. I remember I remained in visual effects until about 2012. And I think along the way, I actually won an Oscar, not personally. Um, but the film that I worked on uh, won an Oscar for visual effects. In the industry, that's kind of known that you are then an Oscar winner because you actually were part of that team, right? It's a bit like um, the Star Wars team won a visual effects um, for Star Wars. And obviously the whole team uh, helped to do that. So that was really cool. That um, won an Oscar, you know, that industry was pretty cool. I got nominated for an Emmy, I won an Oscar. Don't have either of those statuettes, unfortunately. But anyway, you know, we did actually achieve those things. During this time, um, Apple, of course, was going through a bit of a renaissance because Steve Jobs had returned. I think he returned in the late 90s. And I was interested in what they were doing. You know, I hadn't actually used a Mac since my quadra days back in college. Personally, I owned um, a Dell XPS 15-inch laptop. This was an IBM PC laptop. And I used that for traveling back and forth into work. I think it was running Windows. I can't remember what Windows it was, probably Windows 2000. But the thing that really sucked about Windows back in those days was the sleep performance. And what I mean by that is it just used to take a long time for it to go to sleep. And it then used to take a very long time for it to start up again. Generally, when you told it to go to sleep, you shouldn't really shut the case on the PC before it finished sleeping, because that would actually switch it off. So you had to kind of keep the PC open. And I can remember like on one train journey, I used to go back and forth to work. Um, it would take me about 13 minutes sometimes to get to central London. And I would open up the laptop and I would sit there and wait for it to get ready, you know, to come out of sleep. And it literally took five minutes. And then it would take another five minutes to go to sleep, uh, which meant I only had about three minutes in the middle of that train journey to actually do something on the laptop. And that just got ridiculous. And so I got a little bit um, bored with that technology at that time. In work, uh, some of my co-workers had MacBook, uh, MacBooks, probably not MacBook Pro at that point. And I was hearing good things from them. So around 2007, I decided to get myself a MacBook Pro. I actually got one for my wife first because um, she um, was using my PC and I think she needed a, a laptop more than, I, than me. So I, I got a second hand one for her. That turned out to be really good. And then pretty soon after that, I actually got my own uh, MacBook Pro and I haven't really looked back really. Since then I've used MacBooks pretty much all the way through. So where am I today? Well, I now work as a software engineer. I left the visual effects industry in about 2012. That was because it turned out in the end to be just too unreliable. And I'd started developing software for my website uh, for a business I had in about 2004. 
And I, it just sort of reignited my coding from uh, my Commodore 64 days. You know, that was assembly. This was doing stuff on web. I never actually coded before on web. That was the funny thing. But at this point, I was doing PHP stuff on the server. And I was also obviously writing interactivity in the, webs, in the web uh, browser itself using JavaScript. So I just thought, you know, it'd be nice to try a different industry and uh, do something different. You know, at that point, I'd been working in 3D since, what was that, 1994? So it was going on for 20 years. And uh, I'd been working in VFX for 10 years. So yeah, it was nice to have a change. So today, um, yeah, I'm a software engineer. I develop on Macs. Um, we use an Apple Macintosh laptop, and I also use a studio as well. I use a Windows 10 machine in the evening to play games on mainly. Um, I do dabble a little bit with 3D, but these days it's mainly to do, you know, little models of DIY projects that I'm actually doing around the house. So yeah, you know, I, I think I certainly have as broad a, an experience of different computing technologies as most people out there, you know, from my childhood, um, the Atari 2600, the Dragon 32, Commodore 64, um, then the Amigas, uh, three different Amigas, and, uh, and onwards. Yeah, so, you know, I've definitely got quite a broad uh, range of experience with um, old retro kit. And I, you know, I hope those experiences, you know, I have in these technologies, I hope they will help shape the videos on this channel and take this channel in some, you know, interesting directions. So why did I do this series? you know, where I look back at my technology history. Well, I think context is really important because hopefully you'll agree that, you know, much of this technology that we go back and use and explore, it only really makes sense when you look at them in the context of their time. You know, I've spoken of the cost of these machines quite a lot in these videos. Um, that's an important context as well because of course, cost is an issue for most of us, you know? obviously personally and in business. Otherwise, you know, we'd all be driving around in Bentleys. We all would have had PDP-11 mini computers back in the 1970s. But yeah, you know, that wasn't the case. Well, it was for some people and we'll talk about that in a future video, but yeah, not for the average person. No, you know, technology, it's framed by its time, right? It's cost and also how much use you can get out of that machine, whether that's for pleasure, you know, playing games or whether it's to make money on. So, you know, context is very important, I think. And that's why I've kind of given you my context, who I am and uh, what technology I use. So you can understand me a little bit more and the technology that I look at in future videos. I hope you've enjoyed the series because I've certainly le learned a lot doing it and uh, making it has been great fun. And uh, where will we go next? Do I look at Macintosh computers from the 1980s? Uh, maybe. Or maybe I should focus on revisiting my Dragon 32 or Commodore days, maybe. I'm also pretty interested in computers from across the pond. The Atari 8-bit computers, the, you know, the Atari 800, the um, BBC Micro. I actually own uh, several Apple II computers um, because I found that it was very intriguing on the Commodore 64. A lot of games came from somewhere and I couldn't quite work out where it was as a child. But uh, now I know they quite often came from the Apple II. So... I got one of those a few years ago during COVID um, and I found that's a really cool system and that's something we'll definitely be looking at. We'll definitely be looking at the Amiga, of course, because I own three of those machines and um, I was an avid user back in the day and it was only because of, you know, financial circumstances that I had to get rid of my last uh, machine, the Amiga 4000, which was pretty sad, but uh, I do actually have one now um, and I'm in the process of renovating it. So we're going to look at that in a video. All I can say is, you know, there's just so much cool old tech that I used to use and, um, and I'm really looking forward to using some of that and exploring some new technology that I didn't actually use along with you, you know, my fellow retronauts. I hope I'll see you there and please don't be late.